Hi folks, welcome back. Okay, today we're going to talk a little bit about the Australopithecines. We're going to look at this group here. It's really just this group of folks right in here in this kind of um, pinkish color. We're going to start by talking about Australopithecus afarensis. Then we're going to talk about the rest, but really we're going to lump them all together. We're going to talk about some of the individual traits that we see in each step going through the Australopithecines. But more importantly, we're going to focus on how they're different than our genus, genus Homo, which in this chart you can see is displayed in blue, and that includes us all the way up here at the top. Okay. First of all, let's talk about Australopithecus afarensis. Now, as I mentioned before, this is Lucy's species. Australopith means fundamentally southern ape man. Austra means southern. Lopithecus means ape man, but we're just going to call it southern ape or southern human. Afarensis, that name refers to the Afar region of Ethiopia, which is where they found the first specimens of this particular fossil species. Now, listed below are some aspects that we want to look at when we're looking at the Australopithecus afarensis body. In fact, these same traits are going to carry through for all of the Australopiths, but we're going to see them slowly changing over time. Remember we talked about those particular traits. We talked about the temporal traits. Those are traits that change over time in our species. The first one that we mentioned is we're becoming more and more bipedal. And the first step you see here is they are a habitual biped. That means they're usually walking on two feet. And we're going to talk about that uh, for a little bit more in just a second. They're extremely successful. Now that's a term that you'll see a lot in paleoanthropology. How do you determine whether a fossil species is successful or not? Well, fundamentally, we look at how long they were on the planet, how long that species survived. That means how adaptable they were, because we know the Earth changes. Through time, we know the climate changes. So they've got to be able to adapt to the climate. So the longer a species is around, the more successful that species is. Next, we move down. They've got a slightly larger brain, again, than their predecessors. Here, we're comparing them to Sahelanthropus chadensis, the one we met last time. Their brain is a little bit bigger than little Sahel's was. Their canine teeth, in fact, all of their teeth will eventually get smaller, but the canine teeth, remember, humans have the smallest canine teeth of all the apes. So our canine teeth are so small. Where did that come from and when did that start? Well, really, it started a long time ago. We're talking about 3.2 million years ago. So we have tiny little canines, but they weren't quite that small yet. We're seeing an Australopithecus afarensis. They're smaller than the chimps. They're even smaller than what we see in Sahelanthropus ch chadensis. They're getting smaller over time. So what do we see? We see we're becoming more bipedal, our brains are getting larger, and our teeth, particularly the canine teeth, are getting smaller over time. But there's one other thing I want you to look at. Here we see a reconstruction over here on your right. You'll see this reconstruction of an Australopithecus afarensis. What are they doing? What's he doing? He looks like he's nervous, doesn't he? It's kind of like, uh, am I, is that, is that lion coming, is that lion coming close to me? Is that, if that lion comes any closer, but I'm going to, what's he going to do? He's going to climb up in the tree to get away from the lion. This is still their escape mechanism. They're still better climbers than we are. But they're much more habitual walkers. Let's look at the body styles that we can see, the body types, the layout of the skeleton. With an Australopithecus, we see they're still really following the ape layout. That is the one here on the left. First of all, you'll notice They've got still fairly big jaws and teeth. They've got long arms, long fingers. These are great for climbing. They still have this very cone-shaped chest, this cone-shaped ribcage. That tells us they've still got a very large gut. 
for their size, and sure enough, they still have a relatively smaller brain. They're very much like a chimpanzee from the waist up, but from the waist down. Now we're starting to see, hey, these guys are walkers. They're built like us from the waist down. They've got their legs are getting longer. Their knees and the angle, thighs are starting to angle in now. Their feet are becoming much more of a walker's feet and a lot less of a climber's feet. The big toe is starting to join up with the rest of the toes. These are made for walking, not for climbing. They don't have that thumb-like big toe anymore. Now they're starting to be much more walkers. So from the waist down, they're walkers. From the waist up, they're still very much climbers. If we contrast that with what's going on in genus Homo, we now see our arms have gotten much shorter, comparatively. We're also seeing this rib cage is starting to get much more barrel shaped. And that is because our food starts going way up. We're going to talk about that later when we talk about genus Homo. And sure enough, going along with that smaller gut, you guessed it, we've got a much larger brain. But right now, let's pay more attention to down here. Look at how much longer the legs have gotten. These are out of proportion, by the way. These are not scaled the same. This is much shorter. This one would be about half the height as genus Homo. But we have these much longer legs. We've now got a very arched foot. And these feet are starting to specialize for walking and, in fact, running or jogging. So we start to see this transition happening. It happens over a long period of time, about two million years. The next species is Australopithecus africanus, because southern ape man found where? In South Africa. This one particularly is Mrs. Plez. You'll learn a lot more about her in my 111 class. But very similar to Australopithecus afarensis. She's a habitual biped. I say she because we're looking at Mrs. Plez here. She's extremely successful. They were around for a very long time, almost a million years. She's got a larger brain still, and her canines are smaller still. So in other words, now we're comparing A. africanus to A. afarensis. Her brain is a little larger. Her canines are a little smaller, and she's a little bit more bipedal than her predecessor, Afarensis. You guys see how these temporal traits are starting to flow together? If I was to ask you, hey, what's the difference between Afarensis and Africanus? Which one has a larger brain? Well, Africanus came after Afarensis. So Africanus has the bigger brain, the smaller canine teeth, and they're more bipedal than afarensis. Hopefully that makes sense. Now we've got Kenyanthropus platyops. Let me tell you about this. I don't think this is a real species at all. You'll notice this is the only one that I put up in quotation marks. Kenyanthropus platyops. First of all, let's break down the name Kenyanthropus. Where do you think it was found? In Kenya? Sure enough, Remember, all of the hominin species that we're going to talk about until we get into genus Homo, in fact, late genus Homo, are all found in Africa. So Kenyanthropus, that gives away right away where it's found. East Africa, by the way, very close to Ethiopia. They share a border. Platyops, what does platy sound like? It sounds like platter or plate, sure enough. It means the flat-faced person from Kenya. Kenyanthropus, Kenya. Platyops, flat-faced. Cyclops means a single eye. Platyops means a face that is flattened, a plate face. But let me ask you, how many pieces? Do you guys see all these little individual pieces here in the face? How many pieces do you think make up this face? 18,000 pieces make up this face. Do you think it looks a little distorted to you? Sure enough, this is extreme distortion because it's been smashed for three million years. Wildebeests and whatever walking over the top of this fossil smashed it into thousands of pieces. So to call this an individual species, let alone a new genus, is ridiculous. Kenyanthropus platyops 
is most likely the same thing as Australopithecus afarensis, found in the same place, East Africa, found at the same time. These guys hail from about three to three and a half million years ago. That's exactly smack dab right in the middle of when we find Australopithecus afarensis. So in my opinion, this is a smushed up Australopithecus afarensis. So little hint, if you get this on a, as a question in an exam, Kenyanthropus platyops should most likely be Australopithecus afarensis. There you go. It's not a real species in my opinion. I've got a lot of opinions, <laughs> but this one I think I share with most other uh, physical anthropologists. Okay, this is another color-coded phylogeny or family tree of us. And again, way over here in red to the far left, we have Stylanthropus chadensis. Somehow these guys, through whatever groups of others coming along, eventually led to genus Australopithecus. Australopithecus afarensis, the first one in green here, is what we're talking about with Lucy's species. Australopithecus africanus, we can see, came right after. And there's a fair amount of overlap, meaning these most likely led to these. We'll talk about Garhi in just a minute, but right now we just finished talking about Kenyanthropus platyops. Now, let me tell you, generally speaking, they put paleoanthropologists into a couple different categories. The one category are called splitters. Those are people who individualize each species and think that they should remain separate. The other category are called lumpers. That is people who think that species that look similar are found in a similar place should be called the same thing only because Darwin teaches us that if they're the same thing living in the same place at the same time, they must be the same species. Otherwise, they'd compete and one of them would die out. Well, with that in mind, I've got a modified human phylogeny that I'll lead you to in just a second. Later on, we'll talk about Homo ergaster, which I also don't think counts as an actual species name. Homo rudolfensis, which I also don't think counts as an individual species name. So what I'm going to show you now is what I would do to this timeline. First of all, since we were just talking about her, let's keep your eye on Kenyanthropus platyops up top here in yellow. She's going to be shifted down into where I think she belongs, right smack dab in the middle of Australopithecus afarensis. Looks to me like that's where she belongs. You'll notice also I brought Rudolfensis down into Habilis, and I've pulled Ergaster. I even hesitate to say the name. It's such a terrible name up here into Homo erectus, where it belongs. Now we'll talk about genus Homo later in a following uh, lecture. But right now I want you to pay attention to what we've done with Kenyanthropus platyops. She is Australopithecus afarensis, in my opinion, absolutely. Next we're talking about Australopithecus garhi. The name garhi literally means surprise. And what was so surprising? about Australopithecus garhi. Let's look down at this fossil picture for just a minute. If you look, this is the only piece of the front of the skull that we have where the brain case is. But this is one of the most important pieces, mostly because of this right here. We'll talk about that in a minute. And then of course we have its teeth and its nose are pretty intact. All of this stuff in between, this kind of bluish black, is just the reconstruction. This just holds the fossils in place in the museum so people can get an idea of what they're looking at. So the important part about Australopithecus garhi and why it was such a surprise was because of this area right here. Do you see how small his brow ridge is? And more importantly, how wide this part is back here. I'm here to tell you this is wider than any of the other Australopithecus that we find. What does that mean? That means he's got a big brain. That's all it means. We don't know how big his brain is because we don't have enough of the rest of the brain case to get an estimation of how, what volume 
in cubic centimeters that brain would have been. We can assume it was larger than the other, other australopithecines, which makes sense because it came later. Fine. The exciting part is, and why they called it Garhi, which means in that dialect, surprise, is that the brain is much larger. And the jump that we see in brain size when we go from Australopith up into the next group, which is the first group of genus Homo, that is Homo habilis, their brains almost double in size. Well, Garhi seems to be the link between Australopithecus afarensis, Australopithecus africanus, and the genus Homo. How that link works, we're not sure. So who led to genus Homo? More than likely, Australopithecus garhi was the, I hesitate to say this, but you hear the term missing link all the time. Truth is, we're missing most of the chain. We have a few individual links, and there are a lot of links missing in between. You've got to keep in mind, each one of these fossils is an individual that we are using to represent an entire species and in some cases an entire genus. And to say that there is a missing link, meaning a single missing link, is an absolute misinterpretation of the data. These data show us there are a lot of missing links. In fact, so many missing links, there's more than there are links in the chain. So looking here at our hominin evolution, we've taken it from our last common ancestor with the chimps, which led to, somehow, Sahelanthropus chadensis. Then we skipped Anamensis, Ravida, uh, Artipithecus, Ramidus, Cadaba, Tugenensis, all of these, up to talking about Australopithecus afarensis, of which we think Kenyanthropus platyops should be a part. Then we talked about the next one, Australopithecus africanus, and there's little Garhi. Now we think Garhi led directly to genus Homo. Really up here, by the way, where these are on placement, top to bottom, mean nothing. These, all of these charts show us from a time scale across the top or bottom from today, a million years ago, two, three, four, five, six, and seven million years ago. So this direction is the important part. So we see Afarensis, Africanus, and Garhi right here, right about the same beginning area as genus Homo. Homo habilis starts right here, right at the same time. Now Sediba is a very interesting one. We're not going to talk much about Sediba. Suffice to say, Sediba seems to be a late surviving Australopithecus, but they do have teeny tiny little brains, long spindly bodies. So it may be that Sediba led to the body type of Habilis and Garhi led to the brains of Habilis. We're not sure what was happening. It seems that Sediba was developing a body to deal with the climate changes that were happening round about the advent of genus Homo. We'll talk about that later on. Next time, we're going to talk a little bit about these three little anthropus, Ethiopicus, Boisei, and Robustus. We'll discuss these three and what makes them different from the Australopithecines. So we've got the Australopithecines and Paranthropus, and we'll discuss that difference next.